Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today we're going to be talking about the online harms bill and I've got a bit of a treat or at least it was for me because here to talk with me about it is David Fraser who is basically the top guy for privacy and internet law in Canada. So without further ado, let's jump to the interview. Hi folks, I'm with David Fraser who is the guy who if if you ask a canadian lawyer who knows what they're talking about who to go to about privacy law this is the guy whose name <laughs> always comes up so we're here to talk about the online harms bill so i'll i'll let you introduce yourself a little bit more here in terms of letting people know your background and uh then i guess we can dive right in talking about this uh I guess they call it a technical paper for now, but it's really, I think, more of a bill that's in disguise at this point. Pretty, pretty close to it. Yeah, thank you very much for the uh, for the chance to to be on your channel. I'm a I'm a fan, a follower. Um, yeah, so I'm David Fraser. I'm a, a partner with a law firm in, based in Halifax uh, called McGinnis Cooper, and I've been practicing uh, exclusively in the area of internet and uh, privacy law. Uh, for, I guess, just over 20 years now. And if you think of it kind of as a Venn diagram, the internet and the privacy piece overlap uh, pretty significantly. Um, and the clients that I work for are mainly corporations, businesses that have to deal with uh, issues of compliance with uh, internet-based laws and privacy laws when they're kind of doing business in Canada. So a significant portion of non-Canadian companies are within that, but also some Canadian companies from startups to, to bigger companies and from time to time uh, take on individual cases, uh, particularly kind of on a pro bono basis related to uh, when there's a, a collision between statutory developments and, uh, and principally kind of charter rights. Awesome. So, and 20 years, that's pretty much lots changed in 20 years. So been there for the beginning and still there uh, fighting yeah. the good fight. Yeah, our, our federal privacy law has been around since uh, 2001. So just about the same time that uh, I wrote a paper on it during law school when it was just a bill and thought, uh, oh, this is interesting and this might actually turn into something and then uh, hit the ground running kind of just as the, uh, just the timing was just right, I guess. Sometimes the world uh, sort of fits together like that. Absolutely. So in terms of this online uh, harms bill, well, it's not really a bill at this point, but they've put it out for consultation. I, When I look at this technical paper, I mean, it's, it's written like a bill. Yep. Uh, it's not quite in legal language, but it's basically, it looks like they just kind of paraphrased each section of a bill is my read. So I... Is that your take on this, that they've probably got a bill like written and ready to go? Yeah, I'm, I'm quite confident that somewhere in, in not even somebody's bottom drawer, but somebody's top drawer, kind of just primed to be uh, primed to be tabled is, is a bill that includes all of this. And, and I, I do think that this is likely this consultation and technical document is likely just you know, window dressing uh, in order for them to kind of go through some motions. Uh, they've certainly had their hands slapped a number of times. This uh, this federal government related to pretty internet legislation without having gone through sufficient consultation. Uh, and I think it's probably also one of the things that's on their checklist uh, that they said that they would be dealing with through their kind of digital charter, which is part of their election platform in the last election. Uh, not much of it has progressed. So they did introduce a replacement to our federal privacy law Bill C-11 that was introduced in November and has gone absolutely nowhere, uh, obviously. And, and you've had some content related to Bill C-10 to, to significantly change the Broadcasting Act. Um, but this is one of the things left on their list of things to do. And I, and I imagine that part of their plan is to be able to go into an election and say, this is what we're going to be kind of passing as part of our, our legislative priority, kind of if they're, if they're reelected. And I don't see anything here that uh, looks to protect privacy or protect mm -hmm. speech or anything like that. In fact, quite the opposite. So um, they start out with online communication service. Am I correct in reading this, that that basically includes most of the internet? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that there's any doubt that it's intended to be extremely, extremely broad. Doesn't matter where the company's based and doesn't matter uh, kind of if their content is accessible in Canada. And there are going to be uh, probably some interesting jurisdictional questions about whether or not they can 
require uh, an organization outside of Canada. Most of our online service providers that social media companies are, are the principal targets um, might have subsidiaries in Canada, but they're usually kind of research and development and, and coding. The actual services are provided by corporations that are incorporated outside of Canada. Um, and Canadian jurisdiction only goes so far, but it, it, at the back end of the bill slash discussion paper is the ability to order Canadian internet service providers to cut off access to those particular websites. And so I guess that's how they're, if we can't actually force you to do anything, uh, we can cut off Canadian access. And, and which of course assumes that the Canadian market is, uh, is valuable and worthwhile to all these, all these platforms. But one thing that I find interesting about this kind of in a very big picture sense for those who have been, we're kind of complete nerds in this area and have been following along, uh, the federal parliament's uh, standing committee on access to information, privacy and ethics uh, did a consultation on online reputation focusing on uh, Pornhub, but other organizations, uh, I guess, uh, kind of adult content porn sites, similarly situated, uh, dealing with the question of the removal of content uh, that could be illegal. Um, and I think as a result of that, it was pretty clear, my conclusion was, and the conclusion of many people who are following that, is that Canadian police are really doing nothing, nothing of significance in that area when it comes to content that is already illegal, uh, that is existing on these platforms. And some of these platforms are in fact kind of headquartered or have their management based in Canada. And so the jurisdictional argument in that case doesn't really hold a lot of water. Um, but I'm also not seeing a significant amount of enforcement effort. So this kind of moves it from what would ordinarily be a, a policing activity into the creation of this bureaucracy in Ottawa uh, that will oversee kind of not just requests for the removal of illegal content. And I'm sure we're going to talk about kind of what is illegal content under this under this bill or, or technical paper. Um, but also dealing with requiring companies to have content moderation that is particularly responsive, that deals with complaints within 24 hours and the ability to have kind of appeals related to that, that takes it out of the court system. So you're dealing with a tribunal um, that is not as adept at dealing with, for example, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as you have in a superior court. And so they're just kind of layers and layers of, of issues with this. And, and you can have issues with this even if you start from the premise that child sexual exploitation material is absolutely horrible um, and should be driven off the internet or that the non-consensual distribution of intimate images is beyond the pale and should be taken off the internet. Uh, then you get into kind of terrorism content and incitement to violence and uh, hate speech, which of course has a particular legal meaning that not most people follow uh, or know those distinctions. So they say, okay, well, those categories, and they've been pretty careful to try to at least put in the discussion paper that we're going to follow these legal definitions. Um, but of course, they're leaving it up to platforms in a lot of ways to kind of police the initial tranche of complaints um, that at the end of the day uh, will result in the removal of a whole lot of content that is in fact not illegal, but the incentives structurally are there to have the platforms remove most things that are complained about that could be fit into any of those five categories. I noticed that in terms of the incentives, there's a process for going to the tribunal to say this content that was removed was not uh, was not infringing but then it says that they don't have to put it back up it's they could put it up again if they want to if you get that declaration yeah. and i'm trying to figure out when you know when anybody would actually think that was a good like when one of these companies would actually do that um uh, well, yeah, there's only certainly... penalties for taking down or for leaving stuff up not for taking it down that's right and, and very limited recourse for content creators um, and probably in the vast majority of cases, uh, the content creators don't even get any notice that a complaint has been made or even an opportunity to, to respond. And, and at least conceptually in, in my own head, I think of it in terms of, so you have stuff that is child sexual abuse material. That's, that's beyond the pale and either it is or it isn't, although whether or not somebody depicted is 17 or 21 is sometimes difficult to determine and cases have have failed on, on that basis in our, in our criminal system. 
Uh, and I think also the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. Um, if you have an affidavit or, or a statement from a person who says, this is not me, or this is me, I did not give consent to this. Uh, I did not give consent to the picture being taken or it being distributed. You know, that's easier. That's an easier call to make as long as you're actually satisfied that it is, in fact, the right person and, and the truth of the statement. It gets much more difficult when you're looking into kind of terrorism, incitement to violence and uh, and hate speech as to whether or not um, it actually fits into those categories. And um, you could have a researcher doing legitimate research related to terrorism uh, and you can have an archive of content that is there for researchers to use that that if it's legal for a researcher to use, it's legal for me and you to take a look at. Um, but the person who maintains that archive might not get notice that they're going to be taken off the Internet and being given an opportunity to say this is an important part of the corpus of, of scholarly materials in order to study this sort of stuff. Um, things related to uh, kind of historic publications related to anti-Semitism uh, that at the time and still could be used for purposes of, of inciting hatred uh, that crosses the threshold, depending upon how it's used. And, you know, we know that, that kind of the mens rea matters uh, when it comes to a lot of these things criminally, uh, but there's no real analysis of the mens rea part in the kind of what was the intent of the, of the publication on the part of the uh, either the platform that is hosting it uh, or the person who has posted it. And I know myself having been involved in what are what the us kind of technical nerds call content moderation questions about so somebody goes to a, a platform or an internet site and says, you have to take this down, this is defamatory. Uh, in order to understand whether or not there are any defenses available, you actually have to understand what's the context in which this stuff was created and why was it posted. Um, for example, under defamation, you have a fair, um, fair comment defense, which depends upon kind of the surrounding circumstances. And I'm willing to bet that 95% of people who do content moderation for internet platforms and have to produce a response immediately under penalty of significant monetary damages or, or administrative monetary penalties, the response is going to be to take it down. They're not going to have the time to inquire into the bona fides of the content, the purpose of the poster, the circumstances surrounding it. And then of course you get into, you know, you go across the political spectrum and say, who is a terrorist? Um, and what is the terrorism content? That that, and not only in Canada, but then you look internationally and there, there are, we have relatively clear norms related to child sexual abuse materials. We don't have clear norms across the internet related to hate speech or terrorism content uh, and uh, and things like that. And so it, it's, it's it's going to be a mess, uh, I anticipate, if it, uh, if it ever ends up being law, um, and then it's gonna be challenged. I think ultimately it will be struck down. The, the government is kind of delegating censorship to the platforms under penalty of, of significant uh, consequences. Even with regards to child sexual exploitation content, I know there is a distinction in the sense that like Canadian law covers uh, drawings and writings and so forth, which U.S. Uh, U.S. law often protects constitutionally, and so there can be distinctions in that regard as well. But uh, one thing that leapt out at me when you're talking about the non-consensual in sharing of intimate images was uh, this phrase here, which says, "Or for which it is not possible to assess if a consent to the distribution was given by the person depicted in the image or video." And I'm just thinking, how would that be contained in an image? Like, how would you be able to ever look at an image and say, you know, this person consented or didn't consent? Uh, well, you know, there's some things, some things you could probably take a look at and, and you could determine that it was taken in a change room or something else like that. And you might be able to infer or make some reasonable inferences from it. But did the model for the Venus de Milo consent to the the photograph of, of that statue to be disseminated widely across the across the internet. Uh, many of these things you can kind of stretch to a completely absurd length, but they still fit within the parameters of the of the, the statute. Maybe the one benefit of a consultation would be to kind of fine tune some of these edges. Um, and uh, and but ultimately, I think that what they 
put into a bill. I think all this stuff is already in a bill, as we talked about a moment ago, um, and mm -hmm. it's just kind of waiting to be waiting to be tabled uh, by the Minister of Heritage, not the Minister of Justice, not the Attorney General, uh, but the Minister of Heritage, who kind of regulates book sales and broadcasting and CBC and things like that. So. Like the, in some ways, the, well, this government's approach to the internet uh, to the internet is completely absurd and, and nonsensical in a bunch of ways. But that's, and of course, there's been significant issues with the minister of heritage um, and his comprehension of the internet and his ability to articulate any of his thoughts on it. But just that kind of structurally struck me immediately as being very weird. Yeah, it's it seems like the wrong person to deal with issues like child sex exploitation you know images or terrorism like when i think of how who's going to stop terrorism i don't think let's get the minister of heritage involved you know <laughs> well like, theoretically like all of this stuff <clears throat> is illegal the five different categories are theoretically illegal content um and so it's not a matter of kind of regulating it's not even kind of film ratings and things like that that you think could fit within the portfolio of the heritage minister, but the, this is criminal stuff. Who, who's the who's the minister who oversees the Human Rights Commission? It's not the Minister of Heritage who oversees yeah. the RCMP and Public Safety. Not the Heritage Minister, um, but you know it, it, it's it's part and parcel of a whole bunch of legislative packages and initiatives that are uh, kind of focused at kind of waving their fist at big tech. Um, without a particular kind of nuanced approach to it um, and without an, an understanding of the international nature of it and, and all these other different, uh, different factors. So it's, it's a bit ill-conceived. Well, it strikes me as being very similar to uh, what China is doing in terms of the great firewall with a lot of the, uh, the blocking being put on ISPs. And in fact, when I looked at, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in the Great Firewall, but when I look at sort of their goals of the firewall, they've got nine harms as opposed to five harms. Yep. But of course, these harms, uh, my, I would say that history tends to show that once government has a power, they tend to expand it. They tend to broaden yep. it. And so once we create this giant censorship regime, uh, it's going to get misused. And... It's not just me that thinks that. The Supreme Court has basically pointed to that as a problem with, you know, the Supreme Court in NUR basically said, listen, we can't rely on discretion to save a bad law because inevitably discretion goes bad. But it's concerning yeah, it, to me. It, oh, it is. And, and also, you, I think you get additional insight into kind of what's going on kind of behind the scenes, or at least what's influencing the thinking when you hear the rhetoric of uh, the minister in particular, but others kind of talking about essentially people being boorish, people being impolite, people being kind of bullies, bullying politicians uh, and, and things like that, and problems with the discourse. And frankly, kind of anybody who's taken a look at Section 2B of the Charter says it doesn't, the, the government can't force you to be polite. The government can't force people to be nice and, and play nice when it comes to the things that they say. The only things that they can criminalize or, or prohibit are things that are essentially beyond the pale. Um, and uh, we had a situation in, in Nova Scotia where after a, a very high profile death, tragic death of a young person related to uh, a, an alleged sexual assault, slut shaming and some cyber bullying and also the distribution of an image related to that alleged sexual assault uh, where the government, uh, even though I think and many other people think the police did a really bad job in, of investigating and the prosecution clearly dropped the ball on even the most basic definition of what is child pornography dropped the ball. Um, the politicians, they're not going to throw the police and the prosecution under the bus. And so in the same way that the Minister of Public Safety is not going to chide the RCMP for not enforcing child sexual abuse material laws against Pornhub and, and uh, non-consensual distribution of intimate images, what do they do? What are the levers that they have? Well, oh, there wasn't a law there to protect them and therefore we're going to come up with come up with a law. And the Nova Scotia uh, cyberbullying statute was so bad that it, when I challenged it on behalf of a client in the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia, among the examples I gave were uh, political tweets kind of chiding then-candidate Trudeau for having 
fancy hair and and his his hairstyle and and things like that because it was it went so far as to if you hurt somebody's feelings online that was going to be cyberbullying and that's the exact same rhetoric that we hear related to kind of online harms and and i think we need to be we need to educate ourselves pretty well in terms of understanding where the lines are when it comes to the law and you know where that line is is a little bit blurry uh, and it requires a real exercise of judgment and looking at the circumstances. But the rhetoric has become so overblown. You just kind of talk about cyberbullying. Well, yeah. what, it, what is that? And also when it comes to the category of the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, not only is it a criminal code offense, but most provinces have civil torts and, and have implemented civil statutes to provide remedies for that. And, and in no case where I have acted on behalf of a victim of that have the police done a damn thing um yeah and so maybe i mean it's... they're under resourced maybe they're un I, I know that they don't have anywhere near the training and the savviness when it comes to the actual use of computers and the internet then they then they should have but you know everything like that they say it's a civil problem so that what's the solution is to kind of create a new bureaucracy uh, in Ottawa in order to, two levels of bureaucracy, because it's not even just that initial uh, committee, then it's going to go for appeals to uh, this new kind of tribunal that's being created under Bill C-11, if the privacy law, if that ever passes. So layers of, of bureaucracy, uh, and, and just imagine how many staff they're going to have. And I think it, I share that same experience where I've seen cases of where the police might, for instance, lay charges against somebody for distribution of intimate images but won't take the step, for instance, of just sending a letter on RCMP letterhead saying, hey, yep. this, you know, this image is illegal here. Please take it down, yep. you know, because I've talked to some of the sites where I've said, hey, there's this image. And they basically say, oh, we'll take it down if the police ask us to. And then the police yep. don't. Yep. It's, uh, yeah. Every time I think, well, lots of the time when people say there ought to be a law, there's usually six or seven laws already in existence. Yep. And, you know, why do we need one more, especially one? I mean, this one looks badly crafted to me. Yeah. Well, certainly, and, and the point of view that I come from, which may not be shared with everybody, uh, is that some of this content, there should be a mechanism to have it taken down and taken down, taken down quickly. Certainly, I, I have sent cease and desist letters to platforms on behalf of clients saying this is a non-consensual in image, kind of take it down. Um, and largely they do. But if they don't, there's no other mechanism to, to do that because you can't get the police's attention. And, and so uh, now I, I'm, I'm at the beginning stages of thinking through this. And thankfully, I have until September 25 to kind of put something in writing, although I'm not going to be quite about it in the meantime would be something akin to a, a peace bond, would be an application where uh, a, a, an individual appears, particularly you think of the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, swears an affidavit, says that is an image of me, um, that is up there without my consent, the photo was shared without my consent, here are the circumstances, the judge uh, tests credibility, writes an order, it gets taken down. Uh, likewise, that is an image of me. I was under the age of 18 at the time that it was taken. Um, the judge assesses credibility, issues an order, get it taken down. Um, I would much prefer a even a provincial court judge, but a, a superior court judge who has more experience dealing with Section 2B uh, to make that assessment and uh, and to send something out, stamp it with the court seal. And, uh, and I'm willing to bet um, that that would be acted upon in the same way that you mentioned that, that something on police letterhead is often go going to be going to be acted on. Well, especially because when we look at the intimate image uh, uh, provisions under the criminal code, there's a public good exception to that. You know, yeah. if somebody were to uh, rob a bank and they happen to be topless at the time, right. you know, a, a woman who was topless robbing a bank, it might be considered within the public good to still do a news story on it. Uh, but, you know, that isn't going to be assessed if we just put this on the ISPs. They're just going to say, nope, that image has to go. Well, one, one example that I that I sometimes use, and, and maybe it's no longer timely, or the, maybe it is, was what would happen if somebody took a photograph of, let's say, a mayor of Toronto who was going to the bathroom in an alley outside a bar um, where he would otherwise have a reasonable expectation of privacy and, and it would be newsworthy. Um, that would fit within that particular exception, I would argue. And and But if it, if it showed up on an internet platform, somebody complained, 
um, the person reviewing the image would not be a resident of Toronto, let alone Canada, probably, would not recognize the person as being a politician. So the immediate reaction is to is to take it down. And then it's kind of is banned kind of across the board without any review of the circumstances, without any notice to the journalist or photojournalist who might have who might have published it. Um, and uh, and so you lose that sort of nuance if it's just kind of a, a, a takedown request that has to be acted on within 24 hours that decision made by somebody who doesn't necessarily know the context and also the company is going to be significantly punished if they leave it up. They will yeah. they will suffer no consequences if they take it down. Yep, but I think it was $10 million or 3% of global revenues yep. uh, as the penalties. I mean, that's incredible numbers. Yep. Uh, and I mean, I think I I have a YouTube channel. I've got, you know, a Discord. I've got, you know, none of these are necessarily mine in the sense of being responsible in this fashion. But I just think if I were running one of these things and it was just me trying to get something up off the ground, yep. I can't necessarily respond to everything in 24 hours. You know, sometimes I might be off camping and I might not have cell access. Yep. Am I really going to set it up such that I can be liable for $10 million if I'm not you know, there, I well, think the I, only I, way I you'd have to do it is just automatically taken down every time a complaint goes in. Well, it, it's fascinating. And I suppose this question also came up when we were looking at Bill C-10 is kind of when the rubber hits the road, is your YouTube channel a regulated platform such that it has to be regulated by you? Are you going to be liable if somebody puts up a comment uh, that it, that is the willful incitement of hatred and you're camping and you miss it? Uh, are do you have to implement kind of takedown measures or does it fall to the ultimate platform to do that? But is there a difference? So I have a blog at, at, at blog.privacylawyer.ca. It's on my own domain, but it's, but it's kind of a blogger blog. Does that, you can leave comments, uh, not particularly kind of an active commenting community, but does that make me responsible for doing all of that, uh, all of that sort of moderation? Um, but there doesn't even seem to be kind of a de minimis threshold related to kind of let's go after the big platforms, kind of the big internet companies. No, we're going to catch them all in the same, uh, in, in one fell swoop um, without a whole lot of distinction. Um, other than I think that there needs to be, I think part of the criteria relates to kind of whether or not it's kind of an interactive, people can post kind of contents of their own. But of course, you're not a, you're not a platform dealing with user generated content unless you fit within that definition. And I mean, it might be reasonable for somebody like Facebook or whoever, some major corporation to have a 24 hour turnaround. But if you're just trying to start something up, like if you're trying to start up the next competitor to Facebook, uh, you know, Facebook ate MySpace's lunch, uh, <laughs> things turn over like that. Yep. But if you're trying to start that up, when you're just getting started, you probably can't manage that 24 hours. Yeah. So how, I mean, aren't we just basically at this point establishing that the current winners are likely to stay the winners? Well, I think that's that's a really valid consideration and, and a really valid point. I, I've certainly heard from um, critics of these sorts of requirements saying it really does entrench in the organizations that have that already have that sort of infrastructure. And, you know, you hear about it sometimes related to um, kind of some new social platforms that have come up in the last year in order to kind of deal with refugees from Twitter and, and other places where they really don't have any of their ducks in a row when it comes to security or, or privacy. And on one hand, you can say, look, don't launch a platform unless you can handle those, those sorts of things. Um, but this goes above and beyond, which is requiring this additional, additional kind of infrastructure, human intervention, um, and but you know again I can appreciate the tension. If somebody posts child sexual abuse materials on one of those platforms, there should be a mechanism by which it gets taken down relatively quickly. But the uh, the flip side is things like some of these are going to require some consideration. Like one person's protest is another person's incitement to, to violence. Yep. And I mean, it seems to me that if you were Twitter and you wanted to shut down one of these new upstarts. You just hire a team of 20 interns and you say, go scrub that thing and flood yeah. them with reports. Hit everything that's <laughs> even remotely suspicious. 
And then your competitor is done because unless they can make those assessments in 24 hours or they just start taking down everything that gets reported, yeah. in which case that finishes them as well. Like it gives tremendous power to these groups to just flatten competitors outright. I, yeah, it, yeah, and I think it, it's a matter. You look at the kind of the structural incentives that are built into this that that either are uh, accidental, unintended consequences, or maybe might be happy byproducts from the drafters of these legislative initiatives to to think that that we can that they can that they can do this, or that they're they're aware that. Uh, compliance with all of this is going to be incredibly difficult and will require a significant amount of resources to be devoted to Canada, that they're going to fail and they're going to collect a whole bunch of revenue to the general treasury from these administrative monetary penalties, which I also have a problem with because, because they're not a fine, uh, a whole lot of the due process that's associated with kind of criminal fines uh, are completely out the window. And we've seen for example, the CRTC and the penalties, the administrative monetary penalties that they've attempted to levy for violations of Canada's anti-spam law uh, have been completely disproportionate. And, and at least in one case, uh, completely shut down, shut down a business that uh, was not your, was not the company that was filling your spam box up with uh, kind of Viagra ads and, and uh, uh, messages from, from princes with a whole bunch of money uh, and, and asking to, deal with a, a pot of money from beneficiaries. This was a company that was trying to do its own business and, and was uh, the, the administrative monetary penalty that was imposed sunk it, so. Well, and I mean, there's just so many possibilities for this to go uh, completely wrong. Uh, one thing that occurs to me as well is that they're not able to require that things be taken down. They're instead going to require that it be made inaccessible in Canada. So if you've got one of these intimate images, you're probably not super happy with the notion that it's it's still up there. It's still available to everyone else. Yeah. It's just Canadians, or rather anyone who's not able to use a VPN to appear to be outside of Canada, uh, is suddenly going to be you know blocked from that. Uh, it also seems like we're going to get a very weird set of you know, or weird internet experience as Canadians, where we may be seeing a lot of stuff. You know, you might have a forum, for instance, that decides we're just going to block every one of these things that we get yeah. to Canadians. And so you're going to be trying to follow conversations where you can only see half of it because, you know. Yeah, well, it, it's, if you play a whole lot of these things out, I'm, you know, I'm not sure how much of the content most of us see on a regular basis that could even be nominally kind of fit into any of these particular buckets. Um, and so kind of will people's day-to-day -day internet experience be dramatically changed? I, I, I don't expect so. Um, but when you think about what are the things that could, that could happen? So uh, you get a takedown request from Canada, you're subject to this law, you're the platform, uh, and it's within the, the first couple categories, child sexual abuse materials or non-consensual non distribution of intimate images, uh, that probably violates your terms of use if you're a responsible internet company. To begin with, so you're probably gonna take it down, take it down globally. Um, but other stuff, the, the stuff that comes closer to political stuff and deals with uh, terrorism content and what is, what is a terrorist, because frankly, the, the, the people who are being fingered as, as terrorists right now in the Middle East were freedom fighters in the 1980s, I, I seem to recall. Um, and just the, 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 the target of their angst was different back then than it is, than it is now. Um, so you might have situations where content will be taken down and simply not made available in Canada. And we routinely see that for copyright purposes and otherwise. And, and I've certainly heard discussions and see discussions on Twitter where Twitter does block certain content just categorically, uh, to be made available in Germany, for example to comply with their, uh, with their more, more stringent laws. Um, but I think the reason why make it inaccessible in Canada is in there was at least somebody had a relatively level head thing. You, we can't, we can't from Canada issue global takedown orders. Um, Canadian law generally ends at the border. Um, and uh, one aspect of the section two B right under our charter, the freedom of expression that people, you know, it, it's not, it's not expressly stated in in the section is the right to freedom of information. 
uh, you and I have the right and every Canadian has the right to access information subject to only those reasonable limitations prescribed by laws can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Um, and in other countries that exists as well. And so it, it offends international law, international comity in the way and kind of the way that nations usually interact to have a Canadian court uh, tell a company you cannot make this available to other people around the world because it offends our laws. Um, but might not might not offend theirs, um, and so it, it it does have the potential to uh, lead to Canadian orders to disable sites uh, through the internet service providers disable access to those sites. Are they going to be fine tuned to well don't allow access to that video, or is it going to be don't allow access to that platform? Can they and will they get that? Will they get that nuanced? Uh, can they even do that? Say, well, this video. What happens if it shows up at a different URL or in a different server? Do they have to play whack-a-mole? And then also another thing that's concerning about this, kind of similar to Apple's initiative that was just announced in the past week, related to the the kind of proactive scanning of iPhones and iPads for child sexual abuse materials, uh, is that is this the thin edge of the wedge? that we have these five categories. You said that China has nine. I'm sure that there are people who think that copyright infringement is just as bad as hate speech. Uh, and it's even more harmful to Canada and Canadian creators than, than many of these things. So, so why don't we include copyright on this? Uh, why don't we include other sorts of things that, that, uh, that we might think as being, as being problematic? Um, and it really does open the door. And we already have kind of at the same time, cases that are currently working their way through the federal court uh, related to internet blocking orders for uh, streaming sites and uh, and other things other things like that that are not contemplated in in the copyright act but the content owners and the rights holders not even the content owners but the licensees for the broadcasting rights in Canada have convinced the courts to require internet service providers to uh, to sh shut that stuff down yeah i'm sure there will be a long list of lobbyists with uh, their own sort of setups for what they think ought to be taken down. Uh, you might see, for instance, misleading political commentary on that list. Uh, people advocate against that. And a lot of that, as much as it might be obnoxious, is is protected speech. I mean, a lot of protected speech is obnoxious <laughs> because at the end of the day, if what you're saying isn't offensive to somebody, if it doesn't piss somebody off, you don't actually need the charter right. Because if, well, if nobody wants to stop you from talk, <laughs> saying it, then you don't need the right. Yep, yep. Well, and I think one of the things that people don't necessarily note uh, is that we have a freedom of expression right uh, in our charter. And so it gives everybody the right to access information subject to such reasonable limits as can be prescribed by law in, free, in a free and democratic society, uh, justified. Um, and so kind of anything that limits access to these sorts of things is subject to that sort of challenge. And, and so it's not just the expression rights of the platforms, which I think have been consistently disregarded by this this government in this bill and, and others, uh, and the expression rights of whoever publishes the content um, which, you know, obviously child sexual abuse materials and, and the non-consensual distribution of intimate images are, are such kind of low value content that it's easier for a whole lot of us to, to justify. But I think where things are going to get interesting or potentially interesting and the thin edge of the wedge and, and the, the list of maybe four other harms to add to it uh, relates to elections and election campaigns uh, that we've seen uh, when cases related to expression and election campaigns have gone to the Supreme Court of Canada, there's a fair amount of deference given to uh, Parliament in determining kind of the rules related to elections and election funding and election advertising. Uh, and so there are rules related to kind of publishing falsehoods about the qualifications of a political candidate. Well, does one take that further? Does that, how far would you go if you're a, a thin skinned politician, which I don't think should be allowed to be the case. If you're going to go into politics and the rough and tumble world of politics, you need to be ready to uh, kind of deal with the usual sorts of things that, that happen in this, that, in this world. Uh, but you get into situations where kind of critics quickly become cyber bullies, where somebody having their own perspective on something that's a matter of public interest is somebody who's, who's lying, who's, it goes kind of beyond spin to something else. Uh, and so we always need to be cautious about function creep when it comes to so many of these things. Um, 
And because it is easy, it, 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 if, if this was introduced simply related to child pornography, child sexual abuse materials and the non-consensual distribution of intimate images where the lines are clear or it's easier to determine kind of what's what it is and what it what isn't um, that would be kind of the proverbial nose under the camel's tent they could then be expanded uh, to deal with other categories of content all of which is expressive so section 2b rights are triggered as soon as it's something that communicates meaning of any sort other than a punch in the nose um, and so anything that requires the regulation, the suppression of that, um, and then also deeply problematic and, and a relatively new thing in Canada is the government essentially outsourcing that to platforms uh, in order to uh, police those things. So uh, it, it's something we need to keep a very close eye on. Um, and as I said, I, I think that a, a mechanism similar to a peace bond application would be a much better tool for the job and would not require the creation of a whole new bureaucracy alongside the CRTC and the Human Rights Commission and the Competition Bureau and the Privacy Commissioner and the this and the, and the that. Well, and one thing that really stuck out at me here is that there's provisions to allow for complaints to be made anonymously so that the actual person making the report is hidden from the public. Because one of the things that really concerns me when I look at this is the potential for politicians to use it over hurt feelings. Um, and uh, for instance, we've got a, a prime minister who had a blackface scandal. And I could certainly see them saying, listen, that's harmful content. You know, that's, uh, that's racist content, you know, notwithstanding the fact that it's our politician engaging in the racism. We want that taken down. And so we're going to file complaints to get this all taken down. And the public wouldn't even be able to see that these were people connected to the Liberal Party saying, we want this taken down. So politicians would have the ability to use this to kind of shape what the electorate hears. And people wouldn't even be able to judge the politicians on the on the basis that they're doing it. They wouldn't even be able to know that. It's, and, and, uh, yeah, and, and, and there have been similar amendments or similar kind of mechanisms in the Canada Human Rights Act that have been criticized for, for that person. You don't know, in many cases, the motives of the accuser can be yeah. important to understanding the context of, of the case. But you get somebody who imagines that either it is hate speech or it's not, or it is child sexual abuse material or it's not. Um, and it should kind of the the merits of it should be determined only by the content itself. But there's but there's more going on. And it also kind of goes back to what we mentioned, what we talked about earlier related to kind of the public interest and, and the journalistic context. And, you know, we've also seen situations where the police have raided an art gallery um, because of, of what they perceive to be child sexual abuse material, which was, in fact, uh, it could avail itself of the artistic defense because the artist themselves were or was um, subject of, of abuse and was working through kind of similar to the sharp case in a sense was working through that trauma through their art um, and but without that context without that understanding um, it, it just kind of on its face appears to be the illegal content and and can you imagine whether or not uh, you know I don't think this bill or this plan or whatever you want to call it adequately includes any defenses, uh, which would be available in a criminal context and would be absolutely available or should be if somebody was trying to get an injunction, a civil injunction for something's removal, all that's taken away. And so all we're left with is a mechanism that, that significantly punishes the platforms for not taking stuff down um, and, and not including the context and not including the creators. Well, and I see as well, there's provisions for uh, sort of related to that. There's provisions for them to dismiss uh, one of these complaints if it turns out to be frivolous or vexatious or the like. Often determining whether something is vexatious requires an examination of who's making the complaint yep. and what their motives might be. Is this a frequent flyer who yep. makes complaints about everything? Or is this somebody with a, you know, whose complaint isn't based on, you know, the facts, but on the on a personal grudge is this somebody yep. who's known to make false complaints like these kinds of things are absolutely essential 
And how would I be able to respond and say, you guys should dismiss this on the basis that it's vexatious if I don't know, for instance, that it's my political adversary making it yeah. or, you know, the person who's been three times convicted of criminal harassment of me, you know, these kinds of things. How can I, you know, it's bizarre, I think. Well, and I think <clears throat> that example kind of almost presupposes you've gotten to the tribunal stage. That if you just have somebody who's going to sit and click report this tweet, report this tweet, report this tweet, report this tweet for a whole afternoon, going after somebody's Twitter account, does the person who works for Twitter in content moderation, do they know, oh, well, all these complaints were made by this same person, what this person has a pattern of doing that, do they understand what vexatious means? They can certainly probably just appreciate what frivolous means. Um, but vexatious is, as you as you said, or as you inferred, relates entirely to the state of the mind of, of the complainant um, and, and why they're doing it, uh, just in order to either vex Twitter in this example or to vex uh, the subject of the, of the complaints. And the other thing is that in a lot of cases, even if you can get it taken or put back up, you might have sort of missed the moment. Uh, the... Trudeau blackface, you know, I'll go back to that. Those came up during a political campaign because, of course, that's when that sort of thing tends to release. Yep. Um, if you can get those pictures stalled by four months or six months, that's, you know, you've won because now yep. the electorate doesn't hear it. You've just managed to push it and it comes in as a scandal after the election. Well, that doesn't really count for much. So being able to just sort of shape the timing can be such a huge factor here in terms of speech, you know, and people aren't, you know, presenting that information at like just random times. The timing of it in a lot of cases might be part of the speech. Yep. You know, somebody says, I want to start this initiative to protect whatever. And you say, well, actually, here's, you know, what you were doing as, as a youth you know, the timing of it is part of why you're saying it and part of the meaning of it. It's. Yeah. And, and kind of likewise, the, the, for to the, the, the people who do content moderation don't know who the person is necessarily. They don't have, they don't have the background. They might understand, well, this is the prime minister of Canada. Um, but, you know, if it's taken from a yearbook from a, from a high school in, in Vancouver, they might not make that connection. But, you know, similar things come up in, in this kind of right to be forgotten that some, some folks are advocating for, which is that if, if you were planning to enter politics and there's embarrassing stuff about you on the Internet from before, you would kind of exercise that right and try to get it cleared off uh, because at that time you're not a public figure. Uh, but when you become a public figure, none of that stuff exists anymore. And, and kind of the example is there was a political candidate who had worked as a plumber who had been captured on video kind of urinating into a customer's kind of coffee cup. Um, and that kind of came up during the campaign. Had that politician been able to kind of purge that from the internet before putting in their nomination paper, that that wouldn't have been an issue. That, that wouldn't have come up. It, it's not news. Well, maybe it's newsworthy when a plumber does it, uh, but it's way more newsworthy when it's a plumber who then becomes a politician does it. And, and yeah. how do you make these calls? And, and who should make those calls? Well, and ultimately, a right to be forgotten at the end of the day is really a right to shut other people up. Yep. You know, it's a right to, to gag somebody else, you know, because they're trying to say a thing and you don't want them to say it. Uh, another concern that just struck me on this one is you'd have to be crazy to run any sort of internet communication business in Canada. Like if I was Facebook and I had somebody like any sort of Canadian division, I'd be telling them, pack up, uh, you're either moving to the States or you're fired because we're shutting everything down. Uh, the only way you can avoid these administrative penalties is just to say, we don't have anything you can come after. Yeah. Well, and... and, and <laughs> Certainly, it's been my experience that uh, that the police and even the prosecutors have no idea what a corporate veil is in, in Canada. Um, most most of the internet companies that have operations in Canada have wholly owned subsidiaries that are kind of separate from the company that actually operates the operates the platform, um, and and none of which that I'm aware of kind of actually have user data uh, in those offices. Uh, but this bill or this proposal, this plan, uh, does permit these authorities to enter any premises and to inspect records and to inspect algorithms and things like that. 
Um, the big internet companies don't keep those records in Canada or those algorithms in, in Canada. Well, um, and those are the crown jewels. They don't let anybody touch those. Well, and, 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 and certainly if they did, once this bill kind of sees the light of day and, and goes into parliament, you'd move that, you'd move all that out. But if you're a Canadian company, as you said, operating in this space, you're vulnerable to having your premises raided um, and, uh, and having this information kind of taken from you. Um, and, and there's also in, in this legislation or in this proposed idea, uh, kind of mandatory reporting uh, to the police of certain yeah. kinds of content that's discovered as part of this part of this process. Um, and so not just kind of clicking report, 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 report for the purpose of, of kind of aggravating the subject. Uh, if it's anywhere near the line in those categories, that individual is going to be reported to the police uh, under these rules. Well, now, it basically gets a, gets rid of warrant requirements because previously the police to get that information would get the report and then have to ask for a warrant in order to get that information. Yep. So goodbye warrants. Yeah, although I think one thing one thing that's worth noting in, in this area is that uh, there currently is a similar regime in the United States related to uh, under under their laws of uh, related to if an Internet service provider uh, comes across or comes to their attention child sexual abuse material, they have to file a report with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children that does include user information, user identifying information, um, which we have. And one of the big problems when the Ethics Committee had their hearing related to online reputation uh, was we already have a law related to the mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse materials um, that is not enforced. Um, and so that, that sort of thing is not happening, but this kind of takes it to the next level and requires reporting for a broader category of information. Um, and then does it, is, are the police actually gonna act upon it? Will, is it gonna turn into a, a variation of swatting or do you just kind of go into a database of, of like CPIC, like an, an, an add on to CPIC of, well, here are, the, here are people on the internet who are doing problematic things. And then also there's uh, in, in this bill, amendments to the CSIS Act, which could make sense, but could be problematic. Uh, right now, if you're CSIS and you're investigating a threat to the security of Canada, uh, your only intrusive kind of in enforcement means or, or kind of investigative means are to go to the federal court and get a warrant under the CSIS Act, which uh, can be dramatically broad, but doesn't include what amounts to a production order. And so they're making a, a, a form of production order available to, to CSIS to be issued by a federal court judge. At least it's being issued by a federal court judge. Um, and it's not just a matter of some administrative subpoena um, that uh, that other regulators kind of have that power to do right now. Yeah, it's uh, the thing about swatting raises a because they're going to err on the side of caution if something you know is remotely close to it, or even if it's not. Like if you're a small provider, you probably don't have the the manpower to evaluate something. You're just going to take it down if there's a complaint because you've got 24 hours. So it seems really possible that the police are gonna get reports saying, hey, we took something down that was posted by Joe Blow and it was reported to be child sex, you know, child exploitation material. We haven't even looked at it. We're not sending you the picture because of course that'd be criminal itself if it is, but all the police get is this report. And the next thing this guy's, you know, Somebody posted a picture of their, you know, dog drinking from a puddle and it got reported by somebody with a grudge and the police just hear this is what the report was and who's yep. here's who it is. You know, they're getting their door kicked out. Well, certainly yeah, the scariest thing would be an, <clears throat> would be the interface on the on the moderation side, which I can't imagine any sensible company doing, which is kind of to kind of remove and report like one button yeah. and it just kind of gets fired off to the Canadian authorities and they do whatever it is that they're, that they're going to do with it. Um, and so, you know, at, at the end of the day, it, this is a deeply problematic piece of legislation. It, it, it's interesting that it landed with a bit of a thud. It hasn't been well received by anybody that I know of who's credible in this particular area related to kind of dealing with this sort of content and dealing with victims of this sort of content. We haven't seen um, the minister kind of wave it around as being the, uh, the keystone or the cornerstone of any future campaign. 
Um, so, you know, it may be one of those things, and, and you probably recall other kind of lawful access initiatives that like Vic Taves introduced, and, but it wasn't just the conservatives, it was the liberals before that. And, um, you know, there's governments of whatever political party tend to be interested in, or at least maybe they follow the instructions of their senior bureaucrats who say, this is what we would like. Um, all of those initiatives failed because people got mad. Mm -hmm. uh, people saw it as being problematic. Um, and people resent the language if either you're with us or you're with the child pornographers. Um, so it may simply be that enough people taking notice of this and making noise about it, uh, turning it into a, a potential ballot box issue, which these things seldom are, um, in order to kind of maybe this will stay in somebody's bottom drawer. What I suspect is, I mean, the timing of this is very non-coincidental. I suspect this is going to be an election issue where they want to say, listen, we want to ban hate speech off the internet and the, yeah. you know, the big bad other parties don't, notwithstanding the fact that the other parties might be saying, we agree with the idea, but this implementation is, you know, is really bad. Yeah. And, well, and it may I'm be so we talked about, or I mentioned like the first couple categories that are kind of, nobody is in favor of child sexual abuse materials. Nobody is in favor of the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, but the political stuff is a bit of a poison pill in the yeah. sense that, that you could probably get most kind of conservative leaning, socially conservative people in favor of a mechanism, perhaps not a bureaucracy that does it, but a mechanism that gets us taken down swiftly. But when it comes to stuff, content that uh, relates to what can be characterized, what some people characterize as extreme political views, um, then that's that's something they, they can't support. So it means that the liberals are able to kind of point their fingers uh, and and say that uh, because they, they, they can't, it, it becomes a wedge issue, essentially. Yeah, and I'm worried that once they make it into a big wedge issue, then they create a momentum that forces them to push through a really bad piece of legislation. Yep. And that they can essentially end up sort of riding their own cart on this one. And I mean, it's concerning. Uh, I I look at this and I just see the also the broad uh, anti-porn aspects to it. Uh, the we've seen liberal Senate bills of which are basically intended to shut down that sort of thing. But just I keep coming back to that notion of you can't. Uh, of anything where it's not clearly consensual in terms of the, not the taking of the picture, but the distribution of it. Yep. And I mean, how are we even deciding that? I mean, if you talk about, for instance, like an OnlyFans, somebody's got their own thing. Uh, are we talking about consent to distribute it to their fans, consent to distribute it broadly? Uh, how does that get defined? What do we do if we yep. deal with somebody who made a commercial arrangement, you know, in the sense of, uh, you know, some commercial image, and then 30 years later decides, I really wish I hadn't done that in my youth. I no longer want that image distributed. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, privacy is one of those very interesting nebulous concepts that really varies from person to person or, or people have, have different thresholds. And, and we've, we've seen this, uh, the courts have to grapple with it when it comes to voyeurism images and people mm -hmm. taking taking pictures at a, at a nude beach. Uh, or uh, all the way up to Supreme Court of Canada, a, a teacher uh, using a hidden camera to take pictures of fully clothed people in the classroom. And yes, there and, and the court said they have an expectation of privacy uh, in in a public, public quasi-public kind of hallway uh, because the use of the technology isn't anticipated and, and the angles that were used and things like that. And, and I think most people can, can understand kind of where that's coming from. But on the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, so here's a scenario that, that might in fact work. You, you get uh, somebody who is on an OnlyFans type site or one of these uh, other platforms where uh, services are provided one-on-one -on -one, um, for pay, um, completely lawfully, completely fine. Uh, the customer of that service records that interaction uh, and posts it someplace else. And that's now, likely already, well, I don't think likely. I think that's a fairly clear case that would already be covered under the uh, distribution aspect. 
like of intimate images. Theoretically, and, and so, but it, it, it's similar to, well, I guess, so what, is there a distinction? And, and I'm not sure I, I can necessarily kind of opine on this. Is there a distinction between an actual kind of intimate couple in an intimate relationship, not for pay, where one of them records it and posts it online, um, that is a betrayal of that, probably of that of that trust. Um, but in the second scenario, is that a violation of a commercial arrangement? Is it a violation of copyright, or is it, or is it in fact that same level of betrayal that goes to a criminal level, um, because the the work product of a commercial arra arrangement was was posted? Um, so we're going to end up with kind of tricky situations, and and you know, frankly, somebody says this violated my privacy. This is being distributed without my consent. And, and the person receiving that complaint has no context, no understanding of the context. What's the default? It's going to get taken down. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure there's a large number of people who say, well, I don't care if that gets taken down. Um, but you get into the other sorts of content where you can have the same difference of views on the back end related to the person who posted it or created it. Um, and that can have significant consequences. And, and frankly, our charter protects the the awful but lawful um, and and tries to draw a line to create things that are unlawful in a way that is understandable uh, you know I teach internet and, and media law at, at law school and trying to explain to a classroom of people the definition of obscenity um, it's pretty hard in it even in a three-hour class to explain and convey the Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence on this is not obscene and this is obscene um and to expect somebody working in a contact center looking at a screen of horrible horrible content all day to to distinguish uh that sort of that sort of nuance without understanding kind of what's going on is is also going to be is kind of at, at the core of the problem of delegating this sort of stuff uh to a a, a, a platform and a decision maker without a judge who understands our laws, our values, our nuances, defenses, um, and can say, I don't have enough information to make this call. I mean, I could go on a rant about uh, the obscenity laws as well. I think Butler was a terrible decision. Mm -hmm. And the reasoning in it, I think, is some of the worst reasoning in a Supreme Court decision. Mm -hmm. uh, that whole thing where they go from community standards can't be used because that's so we need to go with harm as the standard and the test for harm is community standards i'm like what is what is beyond the pale for us to contemplate or or, or to handle any of our neighbors seeing yeah it's just when yeah. you get to that and that whole notion of what can we not contemplate our neighbors seeing is i sort of go isn't that the whole basis of yeah. the charter right to communication? But that's its its own topic. Yeah. Um, I guess the other thing I worry about with this is that if we start taking down too much stuff and if we start having things like this is starting to be used to uh, neuter political discussions or that kind of thing, or and this is why I sort of have raised the uh, the porn topic, is that porn has been a tremendous driver of technology. And it's also a tremendous driver of uh, people circumventing technologies. And so what I'm sort of envisioning here as a cobra effect, like an unintended consequence, is lots of people now starting to, to develop means to evade all of this. You know, people yep. taking up VPNs, people taking up Tor, people moving to dark nets, uh, just because they want to, for instance, be able to follow half of the conversation. You know, if you've got a conversation around uh, what happened in the States with the, depending on which side you're on, it's either a protest or an uprising. Uh, if you can only see half of that discussion because bits of it are being blocked to Canadians, you might see people starting to flood to sort of circumvention methods. Yep. And once those circumvention methods take hold, those circumvention methods become sort of acceptable places or safe places for all the content that we don't want. And so I'm yep. I'm really concerned here that one of the big unintended consequences is people just saying, hey, I want to find porn on the internet or I want to have political discussions on the internet, end up creating this marketplace for the stuff that we just can't abide, like yep. child porn. 
so we're going to end up, you know, and I'm really worried that we essentially create a situation where our, you know, <laughs> where our government has essentially pushed a large number of people yeah. into outside of governability, essentially. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. And, and it's, you know, I've seen, I guess, a similar aspect or maybe I've, I've observed this whole kind of going dark phenomenon and the use of encryption uh, and on whole device encryption on iPhones and, and Android devices, et cetera. And the police are complaining about they, they no longer have access to this and they need back doors. Well, going dark is a self-inflicted wound. The reason why people are adopting more robust personal security measures, including encryption and companies are deploying it is because of initiatives like lawful access and police suggesting you don't have any privacy right in this sort of thing uh, is is the Snowden revelations about all, all the kind of wholesale abuse that uh, that might have happened. You also have uh, and, and, you know, I think in, on the example of kind of lawful adult content, um, there was the initiative in the United Kingdom that I think was was followed by at least one senator who wanted kind of age verification. You need, you need to assume that everybody on the Internet is under the age of 18 unless proven otherwise. We're going to have this kind of mandatory ID scheme in place. Uh, which and that's could been be, pitched here in be, Canada as well. That's right. And, and so there, there would be tools to circumvent it. But that same door that opens onto into that alley leads to some pretty horrible stuff, uh, potentially yeah. horrible stuff. And we've also seen uh, at the same time suggestions that, oh, well, if you're using encryption, um, if you're on Signal or Telegraph, and you must be a bad guy because that's only bad people use use encryption. And we've also seen the same sort of rhetoric that, oh, well, VPNs are inherently bad. We've heard that from the content companies and, and the exclusive licensees of, of content in Canada, suggesting that um, starting the conversation or trying to shift the Overton window to suggest that kind of VPN should be outlawed. Um, in the same way that they are they are in China, so we we always need to be vigilant in looking at um, not only kind of what's been proposed legislatively and policy wise, but also to kind of track where it has the potential to go, and also the broader influence on on human behavior. Would you rather, as as a parent, for example, uh, have people, young people, access to I don't know, playboy.com or something, or if they can't get access to that, what else are they going to look for and what else are they going to find? It, yeah. It's probably better to have, in the grand scheme of things, uh, access to the otherwise lawful stuff. I mean, I think this is really the internet equivalent of uh, when I go to the liquor store, I get liquor. Um, I have never got you know bought a bottle of scotch and found that it was spiked with fentanyl because yeah. the liquor store is you know they're regulated but you know you're you're getting what you what you pay for because they're trying to stay within the laws yeah. but if i couldn't get scotch at the liquor store and i had to go buy it from some sketchy guy you know out behind out in an alleyway yeah. You know, you never know what they're going to put in there, right? Yep. That's why people get, end up getting their fentanyl, you know, with whatever else that they think they're buying, yep. you know. So essentially, we're going to end up with this market. I mean, lots of lots of people have defeated age verification things in their youth, and that's going to continue. People are always going to be uh, one step ahead of the regulators in that sense. There's always a, a workaround. But once you you're going to end up with this sort of internet equivalent of fentanyl laced whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going to people are you close the liquor store and they're going to go go somewhere else and and they're also going to find other things on the shelves on the proverbial shelves that yeah. uh, that that are not that are not what you want them to be to be shopping for. So, well, and. I, I also, I mean, if I was running a company and if you're a small company and especially if you're a small company with a, a limited Canadian viewership, uh, especially because, for instance, you're located overseas, you you serve a particular uh, racial minority, especially like if you provide services in a, a language that's not terribly common around the world. You may not want to deal with the possibility of Canada saying, hey, listen, you've got to follow all these rules. 
you might just want to say instead, listen, we're just going to ban Canada. And I think that's most, you know, Facebook and Twitter and so forth probably have the infrastructure where they can say, listen, it's worth the advertising dollars. We'll, we'll go through these hoops. But if you're some site around discussing Bollywood films, maybe not so much. Uh, so I'm, and I think Little Sisters Bookstore as well gives us an illustration of just how these kinds of rules tend to be disproportionately uh, disproportionately affect uh, minority groups yep. and anybody the police or these regulators don't like or don't care about. Yep. Well, so, and, and now it, it's not just you don't have the same screening function of the police kind of receiving a complaint and deciding whether it's worth pursuing. You have anybody can click a button to report content. Yeah. And, and it has to be has to be dealt with. So even kind of just the failure to deal with something in the 24 hours is is problematic. And, um, you know, I think Canada sometimes loses sight of the fact that we're smaller than California in terms of our economy, in terms of our population. Uh, we're in the same ballpark, but, you know, we're, we're lucky that we're part of the G7. Um, we're if, if you are a, 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 a company in India, Canada's not really on your radar. And then you look at kind of yeah. all the all the regulatory complications. It, you know, it's when the European General Data Protection Regulation came into effect, and a whole lot of American news news sites just decided they're going to block access to Europe because they they didn't know how to deal. Um, yeah. they, they thought, oh my God, we've we're going to be subject to these significant penalties just for operating website in in the U.S. and and therefore they just kind of blocked it. And that's the that's the easiest thing to do. And, and so, you know, some some of these kind of unforeseen consequences, but that could be foreseeable uh, or maybe unintended consequences, you know, a whole lot of these are within the realm of the possible. Um, and, and I think that overall there's going to be, there's a greater potential for kind of harm to civil society and the internet than there is ultimately benefit, particularly, as I said, I, I think you can get the same benefit by having a completely different, more streamlined mechanism. I think there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms for this that could be envisioned that are just way less in depth or way less uh, harmful, uh, including just enforcing the existing laws and relying even some of the uh, you know, some of the extrajudicial stuff, like having the RCMP write a letter. There's no, you don't need a law for that. The RCMP yep. can write whatever letters they want. And just saying, hey, listen, just so you're aware, this content is illegal in Canada. This person, we've talked to the victim. This is a non-consensual image situation. Please take it down. Yep. I mean, 90, you know, more than 90% of the time, I bet that gets images taken down from most places. And the places who would ignore that kind of letter are also going to ignore this. Yep. And they're the yeah, kind of places that rotate URLs to dodge takedowns and that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah, and the bigger ones are the ones that are more vulnerable. But if you take down the big ones, then what's left are all the small ones who are, who are not abiding by kind of social norms in any event and, and frankly don't care. So. Yep. Anyway, so right. it'll be interesting to see how it becomes how it becomes fodder in the election that we're very likely to have, and uh, and folks have until the twenty fifth of September to uh, let their thoughts be known, at least through the formal consultation process. And uh, uh, I expect that uh, people aren't shy about raising their voices on social media either. So, any tips for how to sort of address the uh, the consultation, or just how to make noise about this? Uh, well, my, my take on it is certainly is to be kind of polite and level-headed because, you know, anything that comes through that, that seems at all unhinged is going to be completely disregarded. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you don't have to go to the consultation website and have a laundry list, here are my top 25 complaints, um, and here are kind of the citations to the Supreme Court of Canada jurisprudence that kind of supports my supports my thinking about it. Uh, you can go through and and uh, kind of share your feelings, share your thoughts, um, without kind of writing a book about it. And uh, frankly, the more people who write kind of a, a concise observation and concise thoughts about it um, is is better than just a smaller handful who write something more more voluminous. So I would say, now I've never been on the government end of kind of reviewing these sorts of things, and it may well be that it's gonna go into the big uh, big recycling bin. Um, but 
you know, if this if this ends up as a bill in front of a committee, somebody is going to ask the the bureaucrats who appear in front of the committee, how many submissions did you receive and how many were negative and how many were positive? Um, yeah. And if if it's 95, 90 percent, even 80 percent kind of negative or, or critical, um, you know, it, it, it becomes harder for the politicians to say Canadians want this. Um, and if they're practical alternatives, again, I think that's that's very useful as well. Yeah, I, you know, if you can't write a volume, which most of us can't, I mean, it's legal writing is its own special animal. Yep. But even just like your top three complaints or top one complaint, yep. you know, and just so long as they're getting at the end of the day, you're right. That volume, I think, is going to matter in terms yep. of, you know. Yeah, Especially and, and also send a copy of it to your MP. Just say I've 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 just done the consultation. I want you to know this is how I feel about this, and uh, and this and this matters to me. So. Yeah, this is I. Every once in a while, the government has this idea that they're going to control the internet and that they know better. And uh, often their proposals are are bad. They're just they want <laughs> they want a lot of knowledge and a lot of control and a lot of. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, I want to thank you once again for for coming on the show. It's and helping to spread the word about this one because when I saw this one, I went, "I think this is bad," but I really need to talk to somebody who who is an expert in this particular field. And as I said, anytime you ask anybody, uh, they either say, "I don't know" because they don't know that area at all, or they they say, "Hey, David Fraser's the guy. You got to talk to him." So. I, my my motto is I think everybody's entitled to my opinion. I'm happy to happy to chat and and this is a topic that I obviously feel feel pretty strongly about. So so happy to uh, happy to share that and uh, and to I also uh, and I, I admire your commitment to kind of public legal education and and uh, having a channel out there that on a, on a public channel talking about legal issues to non lawyers and lawyers uh, in a way that's that's comprehensible that that produces a, a more educated group of people who understand their rights and. Uh, that's something I believe in as well, and so I'm happy to happy to pitch in and do this uh, do this along with you. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, and I really appreciate your public discussion as well. I think uh, there's far too many lawyers out there who have a public voice of talking to other lawyers, and not enough who are talking to the public. And I think that we all do better as a society if people have a better grasp of what the law is. And so I'm trying to facilitate that, and I'm always happy to see other people doing the same and i you know sure. i've learned a lot about privacy <laughs> law just from you know watching your stuff out there and so i i heartily recommend that people check out you know your blog your twitter feed etc just to see uh this is i think you know if firearms hadn't grabbed my interest <laughs> uh i i think that privacy law and internet law is really yep. one of the most important areas that anybody can be dealing with uh you know sometimes i get to make a difference in terms of like one particular person's life but this internet stuff is going to be what affects everybody and it's going to be what affects the fabric of canadian society how much freedom we have to do, you know how much people feel that when they go online they can just express themselves or how much they feel that they have to censor themselves. Those kinds of questions I think are really yep. fundamental. So I really appreciate what you do and thank you once again. I guess let's wrap it up here or else uh, we'll be here all night. Absolutely. It was great to chat. Thank you for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. It's a really big opportunity to learn about this from the big name in the area. And this is a very worrying bit of legislation. I mean, it's not a bill yet, but it's fairly clear that there's a bill written and ready to go on this one. Otherwise, there wouldn't be this much detail and this sort of language in the technical paper. So this is something that they're planning. And unless they see some pushback, we can expect this to probably land as a bill. And if the Liberals have a majority, it very well might get hammered through. That's a big concern because this is a big and overarching attempt to control the Internet. It's, it's worrying. I'm also going to have links in the description below to David Fraser's Twitter as well as to his blog. Check them out. Uh, there's lots of great information there. 
I've also got a link to my Patreon. I want to thank my Patreon supporters. And at the $50 level, Jonathan Wheeler, Jason Elliott, Canada's National Firearms Association, Kyle Martin, Jean-Guy Toussaint, Ivo Nedev, the CCFR, and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association. At the $30 level, Sights and Arms Limited and Mark olivier Damour. And at the $20 level, Matt Ward, Mark Whittington, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, and Andrew Elsich. I also want to thank all of my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following and all of my other supporters. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge and let me know if you have any questions about this particular uh, sort of technical paper, although it's really a, a proto bill. I'm also going to link that as well in the description so that you can check it out for yourself. See, see what parts sort of worry you there because there's lots to go around. Anyway, thank you once again and see you next time.